Thanks for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. For the foreseeable future, you're not going to hear our normal intro or outro here. We're going to be releasing episodes very frequently as things are changing. This channel will be used for a very specific purpose. Number one, to communicate with our patients. We're somewhat overwhelmed, and the more we can communicate breaking news and recommendations from us to our patients all at once, the better. So if you're a patient, we're here for you if you need us. But if possible, please tune in here so we can both keep you up to date and conserve our time for the most critical tasks. Feel free to share this with friends and colleagues as well. Number two, we've organized as a group. We have infectious disease specialists, ER doctors, critical care doctors, and in total dozens of MDs, PhDs, and frontline clinicians who are going to be constantly evaluating the news and emerging evidence. We're then going to summarize and translate that for you here every day on the podcast. The speed of change with the circumstances will make us look foolish at times, but we're committed to pouring all of our resources and energy into doing what we can to help and make a difference. You can also follow our updates at wildhealth.com or our Instagram account at wildhealthmd. And if you're a patient, we're here for you. Please tune in here for the updates and let us know how we can help. Thanks for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. For the foreseeable future, you're not going to hear our normal intro or outro here. We're going to be releasing episodes very frequently as things are changing. This channel will be used for a very specific purpose. Number one, to communicate with our patients. We're somewhat overwhelmed, and the more we can communicate breaking news and recommendations from us to our patients all at once, the better. So if you're a patient, we're here for you if you need us. But if possible, please tune in here so we can both keep you up to date and conserve our time for the most critical tasks. Feel free to share this with friends and colleagues as well. Number two, we've organized as a group. We have infectious disease specialists, ER doctors, critical care doctors, and in total dozens of MDs, PhDs, and frontline clinicians who are going to be constantly evaluating the news and emerging evidence. We're then going to summarize and translate that for you here every day on the podcast. The speed of change with the circumstances will make us look foolish at times, but we're committed to pouring all of our resources and energy into doing what we can to help and make a difference. You can also follow our updates at wildhealth.com or our Instagram account at wildhealthmd. And if you're a patient, we're here for you. Please tune in here for the updates and let us know how we can help. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Wild Health Podcast. Mike Mallon here. I'm here again with Dr. Mike Stone. Welcome, Mike. Hey, how's it going, Mike? Uh, a few things to talk about today. We wanted to go over um, some some interesting articles that we saw recently on genetic polymorphisms that could be related to um, uh, viral uh, infectivity. Um, uh, specifically regarding the, the ACE2 gene, and then another one that's called um, IFITM3, uh, which is interferon-induced transmembrane protein 3. Yeah, Mike, do you think um, we could, uh, maybe just for the, the sake of the listeners, we could pretend that I don't know anything about what you just said? <laughs> And we could uh, we could have you explain to me. I I feel like maybe there's some some SNPs, some single nucleotide polymorphisms that might increase one's susceptibility to viral infection. But tell me more. That's the theory right now. So the first study that was released is called Comparative Genetic Analysis of the Novel Coronavirus Receptor ACE2 in Different Populations. So this one is specifically looking at the ACE2 gene. Uh, ACE2 is a hot area of interest right now. We talked about it a little bit on the podcast we released yesterday, um, but specifically ACE2 is probably the host receptor for the, the CoV2 virus. So basically the, the little spike protein that sort of, you know, the little... Uh, arms that kind of stick out of the coronavirus that you see in all the pictures, that's called an S protein or spike protein. And it attaches to the ACE2 enzyme, which sits on a cell membrane um, and then gets uh, brought into the cell after it attaches uh, inside the cell is where it replicates. So that, that entry is the first point of viral infectivity. So this, this study that they did was really just sort of a review of the knowledge that we already currently have about genetic polymorphisms and specifically looking at the ACE2 gene to try to figure out, are there any differences out there in the ACE2 gene uh, between populations that could potentially offer some benefit, like basically immunity to the virus, because not truly immunity, but basically resistance to the virus, because you your ACE, ACE2 uh 
protein doesn't uh, attach the same way to the S protein? Or uh, is there a potential to have an increased number of ACE2 enzymes on the cell membrane and actually make you uh, at greater risk of getting infected with the disease? So, and from my understanding, there's really just like one or two single nucleotide polymorphisms for the ACE gene. Is that right? That, or have they discovered more since that, then? Just, just 1,700. Yeah. <laughs> just just <laughs> 1,700 polymorphisms uh, that we know of. Uh, there's probably more. Um, yeah. So 1,700 were, were basically pulled out. They looked at all 1,700. And of those, really, uh, you know, they broke it down a couple of different ways, but it, it came down to about 15 that, um, that, tend to be associated with um, potential increased or decreased infectivity. The bummer is that there isn't really any genetic um, resistance to the disease. So there are not any significant polymorphisms that basically make it so you're not going to get infected because your ACE2 doesn't, you know, your S protein doesn't fit in your ACE2, for example. Um, unfortunately, there are 15 polymorphisms that do increase the number of ACE2 enzymes that you have on your cell membrane and therefore increase your likelihood of, of getting infected. Um, the interesting thing from regarding that data and, and probably about the, the only really thing that we need to talk about is that uh, the frequency of, of those specific 15 polymorphisms is greater in Eastern Asian population and lower in a European population. So, um, you know, they found that it's, it's actually higher in, in Asian men, which I think is interesting because that may explain why we saw greater uh, mortality and a greater infectivity in, in Asian men in some of the early research. Um, initially the, the theory that I heard was that, you know, Asian men smoke more than Asian women do. Um, sure. And that was the theory, specifically Chinese, and that was the the theory that as to why the men were getting infected more and having worse disease. But it may actually be because of this these ACE two polymorphisms. Um, of the so nothing that's going to you're not going to luck out and get an ACE two polymorphism that significantly reduces the chances of SARS two CoV being able to kind of get into your cell. Um, but you could potentially have fewer of the risk alleles. That is true. So you could have none of the risk alleles, which means that you've got a quote unquote, a normal amount of ACE2 enzyme on your cell membrane, and you're going to have a normal amount of infectivity. Um, there, there, so there's 15 of them. I did go through and cross checked them against uh, my 23 and me. And it looks like at least version four of 23 and me reports two of them. Um, that's RS 19962537, which the normal is a C um, and that's RS four eight three zero nine seven four, and the normal is a G, and that one's on the X chromosome. So you only, if you're a man, you only get one of those alleles. You don't get two. Um, so, gotcha. if you have the, so if you have the normal allele, you have an, you're at a normal risk, an yeah. abnormal allele, increased expression of the ACE two enzyme on your cell membranes, and therefore potentially a higher opportunity for viral entry into the cell. That is my understanding, and according to this paper. All right, and we can only test for two out of 15 with the standard sort of commercially available um, genetic uh, profiles if you're not getting a more enhanced genome run. That's correct. So I'm, I'm planning on adding these to our, to our wild health array. I don't know how quickly I can, I could spin that up. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to add the, the remainder of the 15 ACE, ACE polymorphisms to our, our specific array. Um, I, I did not check ancestry. Typically ancestry and 23 and me are pretty close um, and of sure. course, there's some other um, there's some other um, uh, chips out there that that plenty of people have had run on themselves. Um, unfortunately, the, the the majority of those who have their raw data, it's Ancestry and Twenty Three and Me, and they just don't report many of these many of these ACE polymorphisms. Gotcha. And and before we talk about how to kind of put this together as a as a human being living in this pandemic and trying to see if there is you know what if anything we can do with these. With the knowledge about these SNPs, let's say we were able to get all 15. Um, let's talk first about um, the other SNP that looks like it may have a role. Um, although my understanding is more less, this last paper you were just referencing is like recent nature, high quality journal, um, obviously, you know, not correlating to symptoms or causality, but but definitely, you know, reporting of SARS uh to Kobe in, in, in the, uh, the ACE itself, uh, with the ACE SNP, the other SNP you're going to talk about hasn't really been studied in this particular virus, but 
some information about viral inf- infectivity with influenza or SARS-1, if I remember right. Yeah, that, that's right. So this other SNP that, that we wanted to talk about, it was recently discussed in a, an article uh, published on March 16th. So it's, it's relatively old <laughs> compared to <laughs> a lot of the data that we're looking at these days. Uh, for reference, we're currently recording this on March 17th. Um, so uh, this one is called IFITM3, and that stands for interferon-induced transmembrane protein 3. This is actually a pretty well-studied protein. Um, we think that there's three of them. There's a there's an IFITM1, a 2, and a 3, and all three of them are involved in blocking viral entry into cells. Basically, that's their as our as our understanding. That is their primary um, uh, you know uh, goal in life is blocking viral entry. And the three specifically has been implicated because there's a significant polymorphism of it. The polymorphism for IFITM3 is RS12252. And in this one, the C variant um, carries with it a pretty significant risk. And that's been studied in everything from flu, um, probably the, the majority of the data is from flu, but there have been other studies as well that have looked specifically at the uh, the SARS-CoV-1 virus, um, as well as Ebola, um, MERS, and basically the, the interferon-induced um, transmembrane proteins have, have been implicated as um, as important for all of those viruses. Um, the, the data from, from uh, the flu virus is pretty interesting. So, so people with CC alleles, which is the, the variant, that means you're, you're homozygous for the variant. You've got you know, two copies of the bad gene, basically. Those people had increased disease progression, decreased survival, increased risk of ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome, and basically had cytokine storm. Um, with really high levels of IL-6 and IL-8, which are these inflammatory markers that are that are released during during an infection. Um, specifically, looking at a, a in a 2013 study uh, of H7N9 flu, um, which had a greater than 30 percent mortality. It was a very small um, a, a small uh, epidemic in in China. Uh, but basically, patients with the CC allele had about two times the risk of hospitalization. And then when you look at all of the deaths, um, about one third of people with a CC allele died and zero of people with a TT allele died. Um, so pretty, wow. pretty big, big numbers. Um, granted, it's a like it's a very small study. There have been other studies, though, that have shown this correlation as well. So um Definitely something that's very interesting. The, the reason, and it, it looks like the C allele is, is present in about 10 to 25% of the population. Um, unfortunately, mm. uh, this RSID is also not available in 23andMe. So in, unless you have an, another uh, an, another uh, genome that you can run, uh, you can't really find out what your, what your IFITM3 allele is. Um, one thing that's interesting about um about both of these is the the concept of directing therapeutics towards people with the the polymorphisms so um you know for example once you're sick if we know that you've got this this polymorphism of the ifi tm3 there are things that could potentially increase um the uh the functioning of that of that protein like for example interferon alpha which is a medication that I don't think I've ever prescribed to anybody um, as an emergency sure. physician and a, and a precision medicine physician. But, um, but theoretically, interferon alpha would potentially increase the activity of this, of this protein. Um, and that's something I have not really heard about uh, anybody trying or using um, during, during this illness, and uh, probably because they're nervous about giving a, you know, an uh, immunomodulator uh, in the middle of, a, of an inflammatory disease process. Sure. Well, so what I'm understanding is we can't test for this um, with any sort of commercially available DNA chip. Um, but, and it hasn't been studied particularly for SARS CoV 2. So we don't know for certain whether there's the same sort of risk to the celial for. Yeah. SARS-CoV-2, but it makes sense that, it, you know, it seems like it's a viral entry into the cell blocking uh, function. And we know it works for flu and it works for SARS-CoV-1. So we know it works across viral species. So it doesn't seem like a huge physiologic, pathophysiologic leap to say it's likely going to be involved for SARS-CoV-2 as well. Um, but that if we were able to check for it, um, and we were able to verify that it's involved in uh, SARS-CoV-2 entry into the cell, 
potentially there's some therapeutics that could apply, but that sounds like it's far off for me. Does that, uh, does that seem like that's, that's a little bit far off in the future? I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know that it's far off. I mean, I, I think the, to, to, to run a single SNP on a genome is extremely easy. Um, adding that to your, to a chip or doing a, doing just like a, a single call to a single SNP or a single RSID number is, is super easy to perform. And that's something that labs can run up relatively quickly. So it, you know, the, the SARS-CoV-1 virus had the exact same mechanism of entry into the cell as the SARS-CoV-2 virus does. So uh, that would suggest... Sure, so some, spike proteins and mm -hmm. and ACE receptors and same thing that, that were... Protein, so the, if the pathophysiologic is the same, it's both coronaviruses. We No reason to expect that it's going to be a different uh, function for this particular snap. Exactly. And, and, and granted we don't have, um, we don't have great data on the, the um, significance and difference, um, uh, for the CC allele for car for say the SARS virus, for example. Um, but based on some of the data that we've got from the influenza virus, if we, if we, you know, extrapolate that to, um, the, the SARS CoV-2 virus, then that would suggest that these people could be at really high risk of not just, uh, infection from the virus, but also severity of disease. So what I would start thinking about doing is, you know, if this, if this continues to progress, I would want to know what my frontline providers, what their, what their genomic predisposition for a progression of disease is, you know, and if I was an emergency physician with a CC allele, I think I'd have to have a real, like, you know, honest conversation with myself about if it makes sense for me to be on the front lines when I'm somebody who may very well have a much higher risk of mortality. So, you know, it's really interesting that you've got 10% or so of the population who gets SARS-CoV-2 is getting really severe ARDS. And, you know, obviously it's not causality, but you could imagine spinning up a chip with the ability to check for this allele, running it on the sickest of the intensive care patients, um, or really anybody in intensive care with signs of ARDS, and then running it on either an outpatient COVID positive population, but um, not really manifesting the need for, you know, an oxygen demand or, or any significant manifestation of the disease. And if it looks like there's a strong correlation there, uh, you know, that, that looks like you're now getting into the time to start thinking about whether an interferon, interferon alpha or a similar agent trial would be worthwhile to get started. Yeah, certainly. I, I think that makes, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, um, and similarly with, with ACE2, you could sort of um, use that to uh, direct therapeutics as well. So there's there's multiple therapeutics that we're looking at that could potentially affect the um, um, the amount of ACE2 that your cell membranes display, and then also the ability to potentially block your ACE2 protein so that the coronavirus can't attach. We could, you know, obviously. Um, uh, choose to administer those medications more to those people with a genetic predisposition to for higher ACE ACE2 uh, gene expression. So, um, I mean, this is all we're, we're taking big jumps here, you know? Um, yeah. Well, which, I mean, this is, you know, this is data that's uh, several days old in uh, pathophysiology, path, pathophysiology that's not completely understood. Um, but it, it would be, um, I guess I, I wasn't surprised when, this SNP data started circulating that, you know, we know from our other experience at Wild Health that, you know, generally if you study a disease or, or a therapy without taking into account the genetic variability in the population, you often miss opportunities for intervention or risks that you're able to identify when you tailor it to people with a specific genetic profile. So it doesn't really surprise me that there may be a population that's more at risk and it may not be just because they smoke cigarettes or they're over the age of x or they you know um have uh, you know additional diabetes or other immune suppression or something else there may be like an actual genetic predisposition to be more or less susceptible to a severe manifestation of a of a coronavirus infection certainly i mean i, I think that it's it's to be expected it's just it's interesting that we're actually seeing the state of this this quickly honestly i'm i'm amazed that that we're we're even getting to dive this deep so soon into the into the pandemic um but i i'm encouraged that now that we know this hopefully we you know we can start moving forward and using some of this information to to make start potentially even making some clinical decisions and and um and start working on some more therapeutics 
So we got to keep an eye on this, either spin up a, a chip ourselves at Wild Health or work with some other folks to see if we can get um, some array testing done for, for these particular risk alleles and others as they're discovered, because I'm sure this isn't it. And, uh, and then try and see where we can push it. Sounds like a plan. All right. Yeah. Um, well, if I could test, uh, I guess take home for today. Um, if you could test yourself right now and you had multiple risk alleles, you'd probably remove yourself from a situation where you're interfacing with, uh, potentially ill patients, people, you know, patients under investigation or PUIs who are high risk for, uh, for SARS-CoV-2. Yeah, I think that's oh. the that's the first first intervention that you could actively make now is understanding your risks to some degree and then understanding that it's different from person to person and in population to population. Um, and some of that is going to be, you know, obviously your past medical history has a lot to do with your risk. Your It sounds like your age has the most to do with your risk. Um, but then there's also these genetic polymorphisms that also are playing into risk. So that's something that really hasn't been talked about um, when, we're, when we're looking at the, the riskier populations. Um, so, so All right. So interesting stuff to come. And we'll obviously be following this literature. We can do an update maybe. It sounds like there should be a whole new um, area of discovery to talk about. What do you think? Like three or four hours from now or... <laughs> Tomorrow morning. I think we, we have, we got a few minutes before we need to record another one. Hopefully <laughs> we need some water. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks Mike. Yeah. Always, always great to hear your take on these things. Thanks Mike. Thanks so much for listening. You can continue to tune in for updates throughout the day and every day, and feel free to share this with anyone who you think would benefit. You can follow us on Instagram or on Twitter at wild health MD for written updates and summaries. If you can't listen in, and you can refer to wildhealth.com, where we'll be collating our updates all in one place. Thanks for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. For the foreseeable future, you're not going to hear our normal intro or outro here. We're going to be releasing episodes very frequently as things are changing. This channel will be used for a very specific purpose. Number one, to communicate with our patients. We're somewhat overwhelmed, and the more we can communicate breaking news and recommendations from us to our patients all at once, the better. So if you're a patient, we're here for you if you need us. But if possible, please tune in here so we can both keep you up to date and conserve our time for the most critical tasks. Feel free to share this with friends and colleagues as well. Number two, we've organized as a group. We have infectious disease specialists, ER doctors, critical care doctors, and in total dozens of MDs, PhDs, and frontline clinicians who are going to be constantly evaluating the news and emerging evidence. We're then going to summarize and translate that for you here every day on the podcast. The speed of change with the circumstances will make us look foolish at times, but we're committed to pouring all of our resources and energy into doing what we can to help and make a difference. You can also follow our updates at wildhealth.com or our Instagram account at wildhealthmd. And if you're a patient, we're here for you. Please tune in here for the updates and let us know how we can help.